Good evening. My name is Alice Camps. I am a curator at the National Archives Museum in Washington, D.C., and I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about our latest exhibition, All American, The Power of Sports. I'd like to thank the American Center in Moscow for inviting me to share this with your audience. Um, and I'd like to start just by giving you a little bit of an introduction about the National Archives and what it does. I'm going to share my screen now and show you some slides. The National Archives and Records Administration holds the historical documents of the U.S. government, the federal, congressional, and presidential records on behalf of the American public so that people can obtain the information they need to exercise their rights and responsibilities. Just to give you a sense of how big the archives are, we estimate that we have 13.5 billion pieces of paper more than 33 billion records or 837 terabytes of electronic records, more than 700,000 artifacts, more than 448 million feet of film, and 40 million photographs, as well as 10 million maps, charts, and architectural drawings. One part of the mission of the National Archives is to preserve federal records. The other part is to provide access to the American people to those records. Anyone 14 years of age or older, doesn't have to be American, can be from anywhere, can conduct research at the National Archives. And absolutely anyone who has an internet connection can view our records on our online catalog. Um, uh, but an important part of making the records accessible is to make people aware of what's in them. And that's where I come in as a curator. Um, I forgot to mention that I will be happy to take questions after my talk, and you can submit those via social media. Thank you. Um, so the National Archives Museum, which is here in the building that you see on the left, mounts permanent and temporary exhibitions to help our visitors understand the types of records in our holdings, the story they tell, and the importance of records to a democracy. My most recent exhibition is the subject of this lecture, of course, All American, The Power of Sports. Sports may not be the first thing that comes to mind when you think about the National Archives, but something as deeply ingrained in our national life as sports is bound to be reflected in the records of the federal government. And so it is. And I was given the job of figuring out how to organize all these different types of records into an exhibition. So I looked at all of our sports related records and the history of sports in the United States. And I kept coming back to a quote by Nelson Mandela, the South African anti apartheid activist and politician. And this is it. Mandela talks about the power of sports. And I realized that the government has used the power of sports to try to achieve, achieve various objectives throughout our history. Um, but athletes also use the power of sports to achieve, try to achieve their own objectives. And sometimes there's tension between these two things. This is a view into the uh, introductory area, area of the exhibition. And one thing that I learned about what makes sports so powerful in this country and why people get so very worked up about their favorite teams um, is the way that sports are so deeply ingrained in the American identity. And our national identity is something that we kind of had to make up as a country that doesn't share a language or a religion or even a common culture, um, we had to kind of invent our identity as we went along. 
And on the right, you can see a mural that uh, it's actually interactive. If you touch one of the yellow air areas on the lower part of the mural, it animates the mural. And the mural shows some of the different elements of national identity, and those include legends and values and uh, national pride. Um, and I did want to point out that the illustration above national pride, which is difficult to see, it's in the lower center part of the mural, depicts the 1980, what we call miracle on ice, which was when the Americans defeated the Soviets in the uh, Olympic hockey uh, uh, event. And this is something that 43 years later, we're still extremely proud of. Um, but at any rate, the, the, the way that sports are so integrated in our national identity is part of where they get their power. Um, the exhibition is divided into four parts. And the first part looks at the power to unite. One of the questions I wanted to explore with this exhibit is how sports and patriotism and sports and militarism became so deeply entwined in the United States. We play our national anthem at most sporting events, even high school basketball games. The origins of this occurred during times of war in the United States. The first time the national anthem was played was during a sports event, a uh, baseball game actually, during the Civil War. And it was a Civil War hero, this delightfully mustachioed gentleman on the left, General Abner Doubleday, who was credited with inventing the game in Cooperstown, New York. Turns out this story was completely made up, but it didn't matter, it stuck, and we ran with it, and it's the reason why we have a National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. It's one of the myths or legends, if you will, of our culture. Um, Doubleday did actually uh, order baseball equipment for his men in his army unit in 1871 in Texas, and we have documentation of that during the Indian Wars. And we can see from the poster on the right that there was a lot of baseball happening on the Western frontier at this time, sometimes in front of a paying audience. After the United States entered World War I, a band played the national anthem during baseball's 1918 World Series. It was so popular that they started playing it at every game during the World Series. But Major League Baseball did come under criticism during World War I because the league didn't stop the games and some people felt that was inappropriate and that people should be serious and paying attention to the war. Um, as a married man, players like Babe Ruth, whose military inscription card is on the left, wasn't eligible for the draft. But the Secretary of War eventually issued a work or fight order which required all able-bodied men to serve in the military or work in a war-related industry. And World War II was a little bit different. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the commissioner of baseball wrote to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt for advice. He was aware of the criticism of, of Major League Baseball during World War I and wanted to know what the president thought about continuing Major League games during the war. He wrote, if you feel we ought to continue, we would be delighted to do so. We await your order. President Roosevelt responded with the letter on the right, which has become known as the green light letter. Um, FDR was a huge fan of baseball. And he tells Landis that I honestly feel that it would be best for the country to keep baseball going. There will be fewer people unemployed and everybody will work longer hours and harder than ever before. And that means that they ought to have a chance for recreation and for taking their minds off their work even more than before. So during World War II, venues, uh, baseball games became venues for large scale displays of patriotism and technological advances in public address systems allowed songs to be played even without a band. The Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem, was played before games throughout the course of the war. And by the time the war was over, the pregame singing of the national anthem had become cemented as a base, baseball ritual 
and after that, it spread to other sports. After Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, there was great fear about national security, especially on the west coast of the country. In February 1942, just two months later, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, which resulted in the incarceration of Japanese Americans. The order authorized the Secretary of War and military commanders to evacuate all persons deemed a threat from the West Coast to incarceration centers. 110,000 American residents and citizens of Japanese descent who were in for these 110,000 Americans and citizens of Japanese descent who were incarcerated during World War II, baseball became a symbol and a lifeline. Um, it was an escape, certainly, from the dusty desolation of camp life, but it also sent a message. Uh, one Japanese American described playing baseball as wrapping yourself in the American flag. In effect, the people were saying, we are Americans too, and we are loyal to this country. One particular uh, Japanese American was named Kenichi Zenimura. He was a big presence on the Japanese baseball scene on the West Coast. Baseball was introduced to Japan in 1870 and was popular ever since. Um, Zenimura was uh, incarcerated at Gila River incarceration camp. And he the first thing he did was build a baseball field complete with a dugout and bleachers and started up the play of baseball at his camp. Um, the records that I'm showing you here are a newsletter from the camp, as well as a high school yearbook, with, which features Zenimura's son in the upper left-hand corner. And Zenimura's um, uh, application for release papers on which he wrote that he wanted to move to the East Coast so that he could watch baseball games. Next, I wanted to tell you about a tradition in the United States, which is has been in effect since 1910. And that is for the president of the country to attend an opening day game. That's the first day of baseball in the spring and to throw out a ceremonial pitch. And you can see here that every president since Howard Taft, except two, has done has part has has participated in this tradition. But perhaps the most dramatic example of this was uh, when President Bush uh, threw out a pitch at Game Three of the World Series in 2001 just a few weeks after the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. After the pitch crossed the plate, the crowd burst into spontaneous chants of USA, USA, USA. President Bush later said that he'd never experienced anything so powerful. And the highlight of this section of the exhibition, which you can see here on the left, is the New York Fire Department jacket that President Bush wore over the bulletproof vest um, that he wore when he pitched during that game. The second section of the exhibition is the power to teach. Um, sports were uh, found very useful by Americans in the late 19th and early 20th century because of their ability to teach values like um, fair play, teamwork, competition, and respect for rules. These are values that are distinctly American values. Um, sports were used during this time to help develop the military and industrial leaders that the new nation needed, or the growing, it wasn't really new at this point, but it was growing and industrializing at the time, and to help assimilate some of the waves of immigrants that were coming into the country. American football um, started in elite colleges on the East Coast of the United States. The way that the game was originally played 
was so violent that people called to to ban it. Um, but public figures like like President uh, Theodore Roosevelt believed football could transform boys into corporate and military leaders. Um, but again, the the violence of the game and the fights that were erupting in the stands as well. Um, uh, led President Cleveland to ban the annual Army-Navy game in 1893. Well, President Roosevelt uh, wrote the letter on the right to the Secretary of War in 1897. He wasn't president at that time. Um, he uh, wrote this letter proposing reforms that would allow them to restore the annual tradition. And the games then resumed in 1899. When he was president, he also called a group of people to the White House to talk about how they could make the game less violent. And one of the men uh, who is now known as the father of American football came up with some of the changes that make American football look like it does today. And he was later hired by the US military to come up with a group of training exercises. And these later became kind of a fitness craze in the United States. People bought phonograph records and booklets and did these exercises at home. And I have uh, some film footage of Walter Camp doing what he called the Daily Dozen. I find that really funny because he looks about 70 to me. Um, during World War I, Americans credited their uh, success with their fitness and their sports ability. and. Um, it was the first time that uh, athletics became a regular part of military training. And the photograph on the left shows an infantry group in France during World War I playing basketball. Basketball was invented um, by a man named James Naismith, who was a college teacher. And he was looking for a way to keep his very rambunctious uh, male students active during the winter months, but also wanted to come up with a game that would teach people values. Um, so he came up with basketball and it was almost immediately popular and uh, it spawned kind of an industry for um, basketball equipment. And you can see a patent on the right um, for a portable basketball net. Um, sports was also a part of the program of assimilation at Indian boarding schools, where hundreds of thousands of indigenous children were forced or coerced to attend. Many of these schools were, were funded by the federal government, which is why we have their records. Um, you can see on the right a letter from the Converse Rubber Company, which makes a famous brand of basketball shoes still in business today, um, referring to an order for 391 pairs that was purchased for an Indian boarding school and a team of uh, basketball team on the left. Many of the indigenous students found that sports were a place where they could assert their strength and talent. Um, I also wanted to mention that this belief that sports could teach American values and help assimilate immigrants is why sports are such a major part of the education system in the United States. All of our schools and colleges and universities have sports teams that compete. Um, it isn't separate from schools the way it is in most countries. The third section is the power to break barriers. And here we look at athletes like uh, uh, Joe DiMaggio, Hank Greenberg, and Althea Gibson, who broke race, class, and gender barriers through their sports. They helped diverse groups gain acceptance in the United States and were a great source of pride for their people. Um, the poster on the left uh, refers to one of our national ideals, and 
we even use a sports metaphor to express this kind of foundational belief in the United States that it's a level playing field where anyone can make it. Um, and that is printed on a poster which was used uh, during World War II to try to inspire Americans to support the war. Um, the baseball card in the center, uh, upper center part of the slide shows a uh, baseball player, Hank Greenberg, who made the news when he refused to play on the Jewish High Holy Day of Yom Kippur. Um, below that is a baseball signed by Joe DiMaggio, source of great source of pride for Italian Americans at a time when they were barred from decent jobs and neighborhoods. And on the right is Puerto Rican American Roberto Clemente, who was a hero to Puerto Rican Americans and all Americans and uh, on and off the field for both his, his sportsmanship and his humanitarian efforts. Um, the next story is one of my favorites. Uh, it also happened at one of the Japanese incarceration camps. This one is called Thule Lake. You can see a photo of it in the upper right. Um, looks pretty desolate and and and, uh, and barren, um, and you can imagine that sports were a, a big um, part of of helping people pass the time in these camps. Um, but Tommy Kona was kind of a special case. He came to Tule Lake when he was twelve years old with his family, and he was kind of a sickly child. He had asthma and some other ailments that kept him out of school, kept him out of sports. But ironically, the desert air at the camp actually made him, his health improve. And he started to get stronger. And you can see from his intake form that he was uh, 57 inches tall and 75 pounds when he came to the camp. But he started to get stronger, especially when someone moved in next door with some barbells, some weightlifting equipment. He started weightlifting at the camp and eventually went on to become a champion uh, weightlifter and bodybuilder. Um, the, the image on the right is from one of our graphics from the show, and the one on the left is from an international competition. Looks like it might have been in the Soviet Union, but I'm not, I'm not completely sure. But he, um, he was a great success and, in fact, went on to inspire Arnold Schwarzenegger to become a bodybuilder. Some um, barriers were broken by American athletes before white America was ready for them to be broken. Uh, for example, this gentleman, Jack Johnson, was became the heavyweight boxing champion in 1908. And following this, there were riots in many cities across the country. Uh, people were just not ready at the time to have a black man assume that position. Um, and Jack Johnson was also someone who did not change his behavior or defer to white people in any way. He was ostentatious and drove fancy cars and um, wore fancy clothing. Um, but his, his uh, greatest crime in the minds of some white Americans was that he dated white women. He was eventually uh, erroneously convicted of the Mann Act, which is a law against prostitution in the United States for carrying his white girlfriend over state lines. Um, he eventually spent a year in a federal pen penitentiary. Um, and during that time, he started writing three, I'm sorry, it was two actually. He started writing two autobiographies and you see a page from one of those biographies here and a quote from the biography as well. Um, President Trump, exonerated him in 2018, or pardoned him, actually is more correct to say. A similar case was that of Jim Thorpe, who was a member of the Sac and Fox Nation of Oklahoma, who attended Carlisle Indian Boarding School, and uh, was what many still consider to be possibly the best athlete we've ever had. He was good at everything, track and field, baseball, football, um, even ice skating and ballroom dancing. Apparently there was nothing physically he couldn't do uh, to perfection or to, to uh, an absolutely amazing quality. 
Um, the school, of course, is very proud of him and collected clippings like the one you see in the center. On the upper right is his school uh, uh, information card. On the lower right is a photograph of him shaking hands with an admirers. He uh, went to the Olympic Games in 1912 in Sweden, and he won two gold medals for the pentathlon and the decathlon. However, those medals were revoked when it was discovered that he had earned a few dollars playing minor league baseball, um, violating the rules of amateurism. Now, this was something that a lot of athletes did. They usually did it under assumed names, so they didn't get caught. But Thorpe was a little bit naive and not aware of the rules, and uh, they chose to punish him severely by taking away his medals. His medals were finally restored in, I believe it was 1983, um, and his record was finally corrected. The, the International Olympic record was finally connected, corrected, excuse me, just last year. Women in the United States had a particularly difficult time even being allowed to play sports. It was considered very unladylike. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, just women riding bicycles was, re was revolutionary. You can see on the left a patent for a special kind of skirt that women could wear riding bicycles. And part of, I think, what was so disturbing to um, certain men perhaps was that it, it even changed what women wore and they were they gained a great deal of independence by being able to ride bicycles um, basketball as i mentioned was invented in the late part of the 1900s and was immediately popular with women but men insisted that they play by different rules and you can see here they're wearing bloomers and um you know dresses and uh they were actually required to play only on half court and they weren't allowed to get overly excited. They were actually told some people, some women were told to sing during basketball games so that they wouldn't yell and um, get worked up in an unladylike way. What revolutionized sports in this country was Title IX, which is a, an um, Equality in Education Act. Um, it was uh, passed or signed by Re President Richard Nixon in 1972, and it protects girls and women from discrimination in education. Um, as I said, it revolutionized women's sports. Before it was passed, only 1% of college athletic budgets went to women's sports programs. At the high school level, male athletes outnumbered female athletes 12 and a half to one. Since Title IX, Women's participation at the high school level has grown by 1,057% and by 614% at the college level. So this has opened up lots of opportunities for women to play sports, um, like you can and at, at the college level, but also at, at it's created um, professional level for women. And the photograph that you see here is the Women's National Basketball Association's Seattle Storm team celebrating their 2010 championship season at the White House with President Barack Obama in 2011. Um, this is another view of the exhibit. Here you can see some of the gifts that athletes have given to presidents during those White House visits. On the left is a U.S. women's uh, soccer team jersey, also given to President Obama. And on the right is a women's hockey jersey from the University of Wisconsin. The central image is uh, Althea Gibson, and she was a tennis player who bo broke both race and gender barriers in tennis and became a world champion. The final section is about the power of sports to promote uh, a positive vision of the United States around the world. And here we look at how the government has used sports and athletes to do that. Um, sprinters like Jesse Owens and Wilma Rudolph have been put forward as triumphs of American democracy. But when those athletes went home, they faced racist laws and institutions. 
And then some of those same athletes and others, of course, uh, used their platform and their power to advocate for change and to try to compel the United States to live up to its ideals and uh, values. Boxer Joe Lewis uh, fought Nazi Germany's Max Schmeling first in 1936 and then again two years later. Um, the match was portrayed as being a battle between uh, American-style democracy and German uh, Nazi Nazism in Germany. Um, uh, Joe Lewis later talked about the fact that some of the people who were counting on him to defeat Max Schmeling were the same people who were lynching Black people in the South. Um, but he was also used during World War II, um, as you can see on this poster, to try to drum up support for America's participation in the war, um, especially support of African Americans. Joe Lewis was the son of a sharecropper, um, and he was kind of a perfect person for the government to use as an example of Black success. Um, but he served, uh, along with 1.2 million other Black Americans, in a segregated military. Um, the Soviet Oh, sorry, this is not the slide I was expecting. Sorry, this is Jesse Owens, um, who, uh, who ran in, in the Olympics held in Berlin and um, was, was also held up in the same way as, as you know, the proof of kind of the, 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 the superiority of the American system. On the left is a telegram that was sent to President Roosevelt. Um, suggesting that somebody greet Jesse Owens when he was participating in the Olympic parade. But none of the black athletes who won medals at that Olympics, at those Olympic games, were invited to the White House. Um, the Soviet Union, as you probably know, made its Olympic debut at the 1952 Summer Olympics in Helsinki. And uh, I have a little video clip that was made by our military uh, celebrating some of the American wins in those games. And I want you to pay attention to how these athletes are portrayed. Private Tommy Kono from Sacramento, California shows the way for the muscle men as the United States edges out the Russians in weightlifting. Kono wins the lightweight crown with a record three event total of 797 and a half pounds. Jim Bradford, OCS candidate from Fort Benning, was granted special leave to compete in the heavyweight class. He placed second, enabling the U.S. to outscore the Russians by a single point in the weights. Coming down to the wire now, it's a toss-up between Lee and Kapia until Sammy lets loose with his most brilliant effort, a running forward three and a half somersault. The judges' scorecards go up, registering the highest total awarded to any single dive in the competition. And Sammy Lee, whose parents were born in Korea, becomes the first two-time winner in Olympic diving history. Sammy gets a kiss from fellow American Pat McCormick. Then joins his wife, who had confidently set sail for Helsinki even before Sammy had technically qualified in the American Olympic trials. Sammy Lee of Los Angeles, Occidental College, and the U.S. Army Medical Corps is more than a medal winner for the United States. He is a living testament before the peoples of the world to equality of opportunity in America. So a living testament to equality of opportunity in America. Um, the Soviet Union uh, was creating propaganda at this time, criticizing the United States for race relations. And you can see this as kind of a response to that. Here's some more pieces celebrating athletes. Um, athletes, uh, you know, it's a similar idea, this idea that, that these athletes of color or from different uh, ethnic backgrounds could, could, could reach the heights of their sports. Um, 
think I don't have time to show this video. It, it uh, features Wilma Rudolph, who was a sprinter. Um, she was someone who um, was used uh, in propaganda pieces like this one. Um, maybe I'll just show you a little bit. I want to show you um, the part where she goes back to her hometown. Watch her in this slow motion. She won three gold medals at the 1960 Olympics in Rome. Um, University. Wilma Rudolph uh, took this, over for the last. This piece was created for uh, uh, for West Africa, where she was also sent as a uh, as a sports ambassador. And um, what you don't learn from the, the from the film is that she uh, she lived in a segregated uh, town in the south in, in Clarksville, Tennessee. And when the mayor talked to her about having a parade and a banquet in her honor, she insisted that it be integrated. And because of that, uh, it was the first uh, integrated event in her town since the Civil War. So here's an example of an athlete using her power to activate for change. Um, Jackie Robinson is another athlete who, after he retired from baseball, uh, was very active in the civil rights movement. And on the left, you can see an example of one of the letters that he wrote. We have several letters that Jackie Robinson wrote to various presidents. This one was to Richard Nixon when he was running for president. And in this letter, he asks, um, as you can see on the screen, how long can one expect the American Negro to be patient? Um, and my final example, uh, um, is the black power salute of John, um, um, of, sorry, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, the sprinters uh, during the Olympics in Mexico City. And on the left is a telegram sent by the American embassy in Mexico City, explaining that the International Olympic Committee insisted that they be expelled from the village, the Olympic village, or they would disqualify all American athletes from participation. Um, these Smith and, and, and Carlos are currently thought of by many Americans as heroes, but at the time this was hugely, hugely controversial and their careers were really destroyed by the action that they took. I um, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions and um, I will stop sharing my screen so we can go to those. Thank you. So I see a lot of questions over here. Let's have a look. Very good question. Uh, the, the question is, what have been the similarities and differences between each president, presidential administration's relationship with the archives? Um, and do I have any insight on each recent president's political personal relationship with sports? Um, the National Archives is uh, the archivist of the United States, who is in charge of the National Archives, is um, politically appointed, but doesn't change with every administration. They uh, kind of have a, um, uh, a lengthier, a lengthier term. Um, so I, I haven't noticed uh, tremendous differences between administrations, and I've. I guess I've been here for three now. So um, uh, sports, uh, I think most of our presidents have been very athletic. And one of the things we have in the exhibition is a letter sent to President Ford by the Green Bay Packers football team, uh, inviting him to play professional football for $110 a game. <laughs> he declined that, but he later credited sports with helping him to develop the character that he needed uh, to, to be a leader, a political leader. Uh, so, regarding forced assimilation into U.S. society, Japanese Americans being forced to prove their patriotism during and following World War II, 
American Indians being forced to attend abusive boarding schools. Do you think that sports have ever had a negative connotation in the history? So it's really, um, this is a great question, thank you. What's really fascinating to me is the way that the people um, that uh, uh, these programs of assimilation were, were forced on used sports, they were able to kind of turn it around and make um, sports, you know, make sports a way, especially, the, you know, the indigenous, indigenous Americans, sports became a way for them to proclaim their identity and to celebrate their strengths and, you know, physical abilities. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, Americans would teach a, a different cultural group a sport and they would become better at it than the Americans that were teaching it. So um, I'm not aware of it having a, a, a negative um, connotation. I, it, it's possible that it did, but I'm, I'm much more aware of these, these examples where athletes were able to use sports to their advantage. Uh, the next question is following the introduction of Title IX, are there any other steps that should be taken in order to promote women's representation in sports in the United States? Um, yes, absolutely, because they're not fully equal, although progress is continually being made. Um, recently, uh, women's national, our, our women's soccer have achieved equal pay, um, and that's a, a major step. Um, but there's still a lot more money pay, uh, spent on men's sports um, than women's. Um, I'm not sure what the steps would be. I, I, I'm not really sure what the answer is to, to you know, getting us all the way to equality. Um, but we are very happy to see the progress that we have seen. Um, there's another question which I haven't answered because I don't really have a good answer for it. It's a great question. Um, in your opinion, what have been some other important moments of presidents engaging with sports at key points in U.S. history? Um, George W. Bush's opening pitch at Yankee Stadium was a fascinating example of this. Actually, I just I did think of another example. Um, the, um, the the first President Bush uh, during the Iraq War um, uh, used a, um, a National Football League game, playoff game. I think it was a playoff game. I'm not sure. Maybe it was the Super Bowl. Might have been the Super Bowl. Um, what some historians and historians have described as just a big commercial for the war. Um, and really, ever since then, there have been lots of huge spectacles at football games, like the, in the one of the opening slides I showed you that uh, football sized American flag. Um, that's sort of a regular appearance now, um, along with you know, military flyovers, planes flying over, and other kinds of, of, of ceremonies and things. Um, so uh, he, in fact, um, I guess, referred to the Iraq War as his Super Bowl. So there's another example. What have been some of the most interesting and rewarding aspects of being the curator of the archives over the course of your career? Other than the current sports ex exhibition, what have been some of your favorite exhibitions that you have played a role in curating? Um, I feel really, really privileged to be in this position. It's uh, wonderful. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful job. Uh, um, some of the things that I enjoy joy most are the fact that I get to work with uh, some of the nation's top historians um, who advise me and review my work. And that's just really, really wonderful. Of course, learning um, more and more about American history is really wonderful. And um, I've had some experiences where I've gone into the stacks you know, where all the records are stored and looked through boxes and then just discovered some, you know, surprising and amazing things and that feeling of discovery is and then being able to share those discoveries with with our visitors is really wonderful um i would say my favorite exhibition was the first exhibition i curated here and you can actually see there's a I'm turning over, there's a poster behind me from that exhibition it was called what's cooking uncle sam 
It was about the government's effect on what Americans eat. So it was basically about food, which uh, I'm a big fan of, <laughs> like most people, I think. Um, and that was just really, really a lot of fun, a little bit more of a lighthearted exhibition. Well, if there are no more questions, I want to thank you so much for your attention and interest. And I hope you'll uh, check out our exhibitions on our website, which is um, museum.archives.gov. Um, and uh, uh, thank you again um, for, for, for joining me.